What excites me about technology is, I guess, price progress, about being able to get more for your money than ever before. Now you may think the graphics card market is finally doing that after years of stagnation, and it's definitely better than it's been in a long time. But I know there's still something wrong with it because I'm still not getting excited about it. Because when you look at it, the situation right now is that you can buy previous generation graphics cards for the prices that they should have been at release several years ago. But the reality is they're a generation old and the pricing of current generation graphics cards still feels inflated. But you know what is exciting? It's the processor market. I don't think there's ever been such an exciting time as it is right now, with both AMD and Intel going at it to offer exciting products at all price points and with exciting new things on the horizon. Currently, no matter what your budget is, you can get a hell of a lot of processor for it. There's a really strong budget processor market, a great mid-range that you needn't go beyond, but also a blazingly powerful high-end that might manage to tempt you anyway since it's not too extortionately priced, all things considered. You really can't go wrong. You'd be hard-pressed to find any kind of graphics card for $100, yet $100-ish in CPU land will get you a decent, competent, if slightly older processor. And unlike graphics cards, which risk going obsolete from ever-increasing VRAM or ray tracing requirements, even these older or slower processors can still have value in the home and will likely remain fit for purpose for many years to come. In fact, $100 is almost enough to get you a whole PC these days. As an example of something I recently bought for the hell of it, this right here is a PC that I got for £112. It comes with 16GB of RAM and a 500GB SSD. Its processor is the slowest, lowest power processor that you can get. This entire PC cost me £112, which is roughly as much as a budget processor on its own would be. But here you're getting a fully functional, self-contained desktop PC. And to prove some kind of point, I made this entire video using this mini PC, just to see if I could. Don't get me wrong, you wouldn't want to use this kind of thing as your main PC. It's got four low-powered cores, which seem stuck at 100% usage all of the time, no matter what you're doing. I found it struggles with easier tasks more than I expected it to, but it handled demanding tasks better than I expected it to. It just seemed to keep trundling on, like when you're browsing emails, it feels slightly sluggish. But equally, when editing videos, it's still only slightly sluggish. It's slightly sluggish in ancient games like Operation Flashpoint, yet seems to handle more demanding games like Left 4 Dead 2 better. In other words, it's functional but not optimal for everything. But what makes it exciting isn't its performance. It's that it's a whole desktop PC crammed into such a tiny form factor with such low power consumption and such a low price. The reason I'm talking about it is because it's my latest toy, but it also serves as a perfect baseline for this video because everything else I'm about to talk about is many, many times more powerful than this thing is. And remember, this thing can already do most things. I'll spoil the suspense by just showing all of the processor recommendations I'd probably go for right now, from cheapest to most expensive. These would be the gaming recommendations, being the fastest cores for the lowest prices, and here are my productivity choices, being the most multi-core performance for the price point. I do like Intel these days, simply because I used to prefer AMD back when they offered more cores for the price, but now the roles seem to have reversed. Intel are the ones who give a lot more multi-core performance, and AMD are the ones to go for, for faster cores for stuff like gaming. So in a way, I'd be more wary of anybody who favours the same company as they did back in 2017. So let's talk you through all these processors in more detail. For $100, you can get the Intel 12100, which remains an even more capable office PC than that mini PC was and doubles up as a great budget gaming option since it's so cheap it will let you invest more of your budget into a graphics card instead, which makes more sense for gaming builds. But even beyond that, this processor still has four modern cores. It should be capable of handling most things, even if it won't excel at those things. Which moves us up to about $135, which will get you a six core Ryzen 5 600. Remember, $135 in the graphics card market would still only get you an ancient or severely cut down device that wouldn't be fit for many use cases. Yet here in the magical world of CPUs, it will land you a perfectly capable all-rounder. And the Ryzen 5 600 is, in my opinion, good enough for any use case and should be for many years to come. Now, it's not excitingly fast anymore, but since it comes with six cores, which are still only one generation behind the latest, I think that still makes it perfectly capable for any kind of task. As an example, if you had a $2,000 GeForce 4090, the Ryzen 5 600 might not be the most logical or sensible pairing, but it would still get the job done. Another comparison with the graphics card market, in GPU land, you're probably looking for the cheapest option that will get you by so as to avoid being ripped off. But in the CPU market, the beauty is how affordable and thus tempting it is to get something beyond what you need. Because like I said, the Ryzen 5 600 is probably all you need, but if you're looking to build a gaming PC, then you could invest a bit more into a 7600 or even an X3D class of processor, and then you'd get the best. 
or for productivity. This is where things get really interesting. On the Intel side of things, anything below the 600K is cut down in some way and you tend to sacrifice single core performance. But something like the Intel 13500 gives so many cores for its price you can't really argue with it. Alternatively, you move up to the 14600K and you'll get the single core performance as well. And this processor is, in my opinion, kind of like the premium version of the Ryzen 5600. Because while the 5600 was the great budget all-rounder, the 14600K is just an excellent all-rounder, and it's kind of hard to justify going above it. But you certainly can. The 14700K is the flagship killer, because it comes close enough to the i9's performance to render it obsolete, and it being so much cheaper than the Ryzen 7950X, it kind of ruins that processor as well from a value proposition. But I'm still keeping the Ryzen on here because it's still a great all-rounder, consumes less power, and has far more upgrade potential further down the line. So like I said, no matter what you choose, you can't really go wrong with processors. They all seem so good at the moment and I get untold amounts of joy just looking up reviews of them and thinking about what I get for various use cases when I'm trying to get to sleep at night. Forget counting sheep, processors are what I dream of in bed. But returning to the Ryzen 5 600, it's crazy to think that below that is the 5500 and then below that the 4600G, which in any normal period would be perfectly good budget buys. But since the 5600 only costs about $30 more, and with none of the same hang-ups, it renders those cheaper ones all but obsolete. That is how good the processor market is right now. There was a time, long, long ago, when the graphics card market was in a similar position. The Radeon 4850 and 4870 are legendary for being fast and affordable, but below them was a perfectly competent product stack. You had the 4830, the 4770, and even the 4670, which didn't even need a fan. Some of them just came passively cooled with a heatsink on them. And look at the performance. It wasn't that much below the speeds of the high-end graphics cards. Back then, the market was so affordable, a few dollars more would land you a significantly better product, and it was a no-brainer to go for that option. For $50 more than the low end, you'd get the mid-range option, or for an extra $50 on top of that, you'd be jumping into the high end. It's such a far cry from today, where you're talking more like $500 simply to reach the mid-range, or $500 on top of that to enter the high end. God, I miss the old days. Though, of course, no matter which one you bought back then, it was rendered obsolete by the next generation. While at least today, when you buy something, it'll probably be the same price in five years' time. Why is the processor market right now so good? Well, it's because both AMD and Intel are highly competitive. Both offer a range of processors that are worth buying. And what's so exciting about this is that they've gone about offering this in such different ways. I feel like AMD's main processor lineup has kind of stagnated since Ryzen was first released. Seven years later, the 600 tier still has six cores, the 700 and 800 still have eight, and the prices for these numbers of cores haven't exactly dropped. So this has been very boring for me to follow. At least you don't need an expensive Threadripper platform for more than eight cores now, so I'll give them credit for that. For a while, it seemed like AMD were neglecting the budget market. Remember the Ryzen 1600 AF? Six cores for an impossibly low price point? Yeah, they were equally impossible to find. Then it felt like the budget Ryzen 3100 and 3300X were also released in such limited quantities that they couldn't be had anywhere either. And then AMD launched their Ryzen 5000 series, with the cheapest option being a $300 six-core part, and it would be another 18 months before they released anything below that. At least Intel would launch a full stack of processors every year. Their 10 and 11 series weren't well received at all, but they did at least offer decent, affordable, and obtainable four and six-core offerings at price points that AMD were neglecting. And have you noticed how weird Intel's pricing is? That's because Intel are releasing them in line with inflation. An i5 or an i7 today will cost almost the exact same amount as one from 15 years ago, but will of course be a lot more powerful and have more cores. But right now I can't criticize AMD for their budget processors. Their support for the ancient AM4 platform is now legendary, and they even released a few more budget options for it this year. Yes, I'm sure it has encouraged many people to stick with it for a while longer, but I'm equally sure it swayed a lot of people to go over to AM5 instead of Intel, in the hope that AMD will give their new platform the same care and long lifespan. So AMD's current lineup is solid enough, but I found their side projects to be the more exciting. AMD have long been in the best position to offer a decent processor graphics card combination, and with the Ryzen 2200G they finally achieved both for just $100, which made it the ultimate, ultra-budget, all-in-one gaming chip. However, since then they haven't struck such a great balance of gaming performance and affordability. My previous video moaned about how their 8000Gs cost too much to justify their gaming performance, so I guess right now the best budget gaming APU is probably the 4600G. But even for ultra-budget needs, it's getting a little long in the tooth these days. And no, not just the processor, but the graphics as well. AMD's 3D cache chips have been excellent, provided you want gaming and nothing else. I personally see their normal chips like the 7600 as being fast enough for gaming already, 
but for purely gaming builds, products like the 5800X3D and 7800X3D are awesome and can make a lot of sense. So since finding their footing with Ryzen in 2017, AMD have only got stronger in incremental steps ever since. Meanwhile, Intel have had many problems. High power consumption, dead platforms, constantly being slow to release new techs or having to re-release similar stuff for several years in a row, but at the same time, these weaknesses have encouraged them to be competitive in other ways. For instance, it's forced Intel to actually innovate for once and to go down a fascinating route of offering two different types of cores in the form of P and E cores, which I think is the most exciting development since Ryzen's launch in 2017. It staggers me how much negative press these E cores get when Intel are being very conservative with them. They're still offering a competitive number of P cores for their price, and these E cores are essentially being bundled into products to boost multi core performance. Which I've seen being twisted as being a negative thing, but that's what more cores are for. Half the number of E cores, and that's roughly the number of P cores it's equivalent to in terms of multi core performance. So long as the important stuff is prioritised on the fast P cores, then there's no downside. You know what? I'd even argue that Intel and AMD's roles have reversed. Back when Ryzen was new, AMD would offer more, but slightly slower cores than Intel did, and a strong argument could be made for why Intel would be the better option for gaming because of their faster cores. But now, and especially in the mid-range, AMD are offering fewer but faster cores than Intel are. Provided your use case hasn't changed, you should now be fanboying for the opposite company now than you were in 2017. I really don't get the point in fanboying billion dollar companies, but I do fanboy general hardware progress, and right now is a very exciting time for me. So right now AMD and Intel are both doing things very differently, yet are oddly competitive and it's great news for us consumers. And the future doesn't look boring either, because they're beginning to steal from one another. Intel are beginning to experiment with gluing processor parts together, which they call tiles, and AMD are borrowing from Intel by creating a smaller kind of core in the form of their Zen 4C and 5C designs. Yet while on the surface they may be borrowing from one another, they're doing it in different ways. So it's only going to get more exciting to see which approach ultimately wins. I'm yet to see proper benchmarks for AMD's new, smaller cores. They lop off a load of cash and are clocked quite a bit lower, but all else about them is apparently identical to the full cores. So they're nowhere near as small as Intel's E cores are, which can cram four of these things into the same space as one of Intel's big cores. But I expect AMD's smaller C cores to perform better than an E core, but under AMD's full cores in terms of performance. So it's very exciting, and we're seeing them start to roll out in their more budget offerings. In other words, AMD are using these new smaller cores instead of their full cores in the low end. Intel's E-cores are used differently. They tend to increase in number as the price of the processor goes up, where they're increasingly relied on to make up the multi-core performance deficit there would be otherwise between Intel's and AMD's processors. And you now get low power processors like the N100 which have four E-cores and nothing else not a single P-core in sight. So it's interesting to see these E-cores not just being used for extra multi-core performance, but also to see it being used as Intel's power efficient core of choice. Though on the topic of power consumption, Intel are far worse than AMD right now. This isn't something they've really done much about until now, in fact it's almost as though they've doubled down and embraced their power hungry nature simply to clock things higher and to edge out AMD for performance at a terrible, terrible cost to power efficiency. But all that's changing with Meteor Lake. These new laptop only processors, for now, have a bunch of different chips all glued together, yet Intel's use of this chiplet glue couldn't be more different to AMD's. So AMD glued a bunch of identical chips together to multiply performance. Unfortunately, connecting multiple chips together requires power, so the more they try to string together, the more power that's being used simply to get them to communicate with one another. So you'd think Intel going down this route would be disastrous for their power efficiency, but due to the way they've done it, it'll actually improve it. So they've got one chip for processor cores, another for graphics cores, and so on. But the clever bit is to have this SOC tile which has a little bit of everything on it. It has a few low power E cores, a few graphics cores, and the processor will do its best to only use this bit of the processor as much as it can. Because if you think about your computer, most of the time it's idle or doing something that doesn't require much power like watching a video or browsing dank memes. And during these times, this one SOC bit of the processor should be able to deal with the workload itself, which means the processor doesn't need to activate the other bits and to draw more power. It's only when you activate an intensive workload like gaming or rendering that the processor tile will kick in. At that point extra inefficiency may occur due to there being separate chips communicating with each other. But maybe that doesn't matter if 90% of the time these extra tiles don't even need to be on at all. So it's all very exciting stuff. We're about to find out how successful AMD's and Intel's new strategies will be. Then I have no doubt they'll borrow what works from each other again in their future designs. But for now, the designs couldn't be more different, or my hard-on for hardware more erect.